All right, so this is how we started the propagation within the town and why we're doing it and why cohogs are so important. Okay, so basically the entire keep was sued by the EPA for their clean water. Um, the entire estuary system, in, at least Mashpee, is impaired by nitrogen. And that's primarily from septic systems, runoff, um, using, using fertilizer in your, in your lawns, etc. So what the town did is we came... Okay, <laughs> sorry. So what the town did is we looked at our invadements and we hired somebody to come in and look to see what we can do to remediate the nitrogen in the area. Okay, so here's just a map of the impaired embayments within the town. Here's Mashpee right here, I just wanted to point out. This little area right here is Bacoyet Bay. As you can see, we're extremely impaired. So what you see when you have high nitrogen in the water is we see excess nitrogen blooms. Okay, not gonna work for me. Huh? Can you just do this for me? Okay. So with increased nitrogen, we see anoxia from the algae bloom. So basically what happens is with the nitrogen coming into a system, it increases algae blooms in the water. So algae feeds on this nitrogen. And when we see these increased blooms, they shade the algae at the bottom. So this creates an anoxic environment. So with the algae blooms, we see loss of eelgrass. We see habitat degrade degradation. Um, we also see a loss of species. There's an absence of sunlight penetrating the bottom. And we see a lot of species um, not able to survive in these areas, so they'll seek other areas in the embayments. So in the Mashpee River and in Shoestring Bay, they're so impaired that we don't see certain species like cohogs and oysters. They've moved to other areas in the bay where they can survive, where oxygen is prevalent. So in the Mashpee River, we're so impaired that we do see these oxygen events at night where there's depletion, there's no oxygen at night. So the entire Cape came up with a 208 plan, and with this plan, we can use shellfish to remediate the nitrogen in our embayments. So we looked at both embayments, we looked at Papanesset and McCoyet, and today we're going to be talking about McCoyet primarily because we use cohogs in this area. Okay, so why did we decide to use shellfish in our embayments? So we use shellfish because we can take care of the immediate area there. And they're less costly as um, these stormwater facilities that we see and the septic treatment facilities are very, very expensive. These are estuarine based remediations. So the shellfish that we use, we're taking care of the problem as it stands now. So these are, like I'd like to reiterate, Shellfish does not take care of the entire problem. We need to start on their land too. So what the town has done is we've also come up with our phase one implementation, phase two. We're currently in phase one where we're using shellfish in the area and we're looking at stormwater remediation, septic treatment tie-ups. So certain facilities have septic treatment facilities already. New Seabury has one, the Mastery Commons has one, Southport has one. So we're, we're doing what we can to take care of the nitrogen now. Okay, so this is just the, the we hired an um, agency to come in and look at the Wakoya Bay system and the Papanisset Bay system. We also took samples of the shellfish in Wakoya Bay to see how much nitrogen they actually can take out. So under the Federal Clean Water Act, this is the areas of embayments that need cleanup. Let me show you here. So Hamlin Pond is the most impaired system for nitrogen, so we need to do the most cleanup there with shellfish. It's estimated that we'll need to put in 11 million shellfish to clean up the nitrogen in that area. Yes. So we're looking for volunteers, and that's why we're here today, is to recruit and to see who, who is willing to come and help this project. It's very important to the town to get there and have people help us is going to only help the overall goal of clean water. Um, due to budgetary restrictions, we're a department of four, so um, we're really looking for some hands-on um, group activities. We do a lot with our shellfish propagation. We build gear, we, um, <laughs> we build bags, 
We take care of the cohogs when we get them from our aquaculture facilities, so that, that means we're going to clean them in their upweller systems, and I'll talk a little bit about that now. Okay, so this is just an area to show what we need to do and where we need to do it. So as you can see, Hamlin Pond, you need, you need to remove 3.4 nit oh total nitrogen, tons of nitrogen per year. So that is the most impaired system. That is one area that we've seen improvement as well from our seeding. Okay, so here in Wakoyet, we have fisheries restoration that we've done so far. So far, we've put in over 8 million within the last two years, and it, the numbers are looking to go up. We're looking to be around 20 million for the entire area. Um, we also have new aquaculture farms that are starting up that will only help the clean water, the overall goal. So we have two farms. We have them in Hamlin Pond, and we have one in Great River. So prior to our decision making of using cohogs to clean up nitrogen in our water abatements, we did some sampling. We went out there and we tested the total nitrogen in the cohogs, and we found that cohogs are just as good as oysters at filtering out nitrogen, and um, they they can have as much as 0.5 milligrams of nitrogen that's incorporated into their gut and to their shell, and that's at their smallest size. So that's that's the cherries, the, the little necks. So each little neck can take out. 0.5 grams of nitrogen. And as they get bigger, that's more grams of nitrogen they'll take out overall. So this is the estimation for cleanup through the Clean Water Act. So we would need to grow 11 million cohogs in Hamlin Pond, 1 million cohogs in Little River, 3 million cohogs in Dehu, and 3 million cohogs in Great River, giving us a total of 20 million cohogs that we'll need to grow each year and years to come to to get that clean water and to clean up our areas. There is hope for Hamlin Pond. We've already seen improvement. So as long as we keep up with the issues that we see in the water, like we do see harmful algae blooms that do affect their growth. So what the town does is we also do water quality monitoring and we look for um, certain species that can inhibit the growth of cohogs and they can um, make them sick. So we do look for um, these species. The first one is Alexandrium, the second one is Cochlidinium, and the other one is Pseudonitia. So we have other issues. We also have crabs that predate on our cohogs that we need to go out there and look at for our crab traps. So we have crab traps deployed throughout Great River in Hamlin Pond where we collect the crabs and we remove them from the area. We bait the traps. Um, this is just so we can ensure that our propagation efforts are are going to are not, are not for naught. <laughs> so. This is just an aerial of the areas that we have in town. Pointer doesn't work. But anyways, the one in Hamlin Pond, the yellow stars are our, our commercial aquaculture facilities. So we have um, the Burtis Aquaculture Grant in Hamlin Pond. And we have the Ron Hawk Aquaculture Grant at the end of Great River. And in Little River here, that little green star is where we do all of our cohog propagation at the Little River Town Complex. So before we started our seeding efforts, we went around the bay and we did interval sampling to see what was actually there and what was present. So we did two foot transect works and we looked for all of the cohogs that were there prior to our propagation. So, and we looked at the sediment type and what areas could be utilized for the cohogs. So the cohogs do like a sandy silt bottom, so we looked for those areas during our sampling. And we outlined them in our map here. So we found through working that our cohogs propagation works pretty well in Little River and Great River. We tried in Jehu, and for some reason they just didn't take. Um, you do see these problems and we have no reason why they didn't take. And we're we're thinking it's more predation, and we've been lacking on our predation methods like um, crab trapping, and we do do netting too. We just haven't had the help to do it, so we're looking for volunteers. Um, currently, we probably have just a handful, like five. Yes, I would like to have at least a group of 30 to 40 people to come and help us with our 
um, multiple projects that we have. So when we do seed these areas with the cohogs, once they reach an inch, um, we then have to go back and take them out underneath their nets. So we put them down under a blanket net to prevent the crabs from coming in and devouring them. So we then need to go back and break them out of the area and then disperse them in the areas where we're looking to clean up. Um, we do this to ensure their growth when they're at that size at an inch. They have a high predation. They just, they don't do as well. Um, so the predator netting helps them get to a size of two inches where then we can see them really remove the nitrogen and then people like for their family permits can go and harvest. So this is just a picture of the seed that we get from the hatchery. We get them at, they're just about the size of, well they're two millimeters. So it's like the very back of the pen point size. Yeah, they're very small and we grow them in our upweller facilities down at Little River. So basically what we do is we pump water from Little River into a tank. And this tank has um, silos within them. So here's a picture of our, our upwellers. These are brand new. We just got them from uh, Nova Scotia, Canada. And they were um, fabricated based on our need. Um, there's a center trough system where the water goes out into Little River. And then we have pumps that bring water into the tank. And then there's these mesh silos where water is constantly flowing from underneath into the center trough and back out. So they have a constant flow of food. So when we have volunteers, um, we're looking to have people come down and routinely clean these upwellers. They're drained um, every two days and you need to have a fresh water rinse to make sure that they're cleaned off and that you should ensure their growth. We have a very small growing season, so we need to get them to a size where they will have lower predation. Um, that's just, just constant maintenance, making sure they're nice and thin so they can feed. So cohogs have a, a siphon where oysters have a gill. Um, oysters can be stocked to a very high density in these silos, whereas cohogs cannot. Um, they have siphons. They need to stick their siphons in between the other cohogs. So it's constantly thinning these silos. We also have our bottom trays here that they go on into in a later stage. But after the land-based upweller, we have floating upwellers within our town dock. So that's a picture of these here. So it's basically the same system, it's just within the town dock and it's floating. We have five of these units. So it's a central trough system, just like the one on the land, and we pump water using an ice eater within the dock. So the water is coming up above these silos and they're able to feed, and then the water goes out through the center trough. And here's just a picture of our flipsies. So there's five of those units down at Little River. And with our volunteers, we're hoping to have them as, help with that as well by lifting these up and cleaning them because they do require routine maintenance as well. And that's, no, this is, we start them up in May and we probably go to October. So this is the two nursery stages. So when they're at um, two millimeters to like seven millimeters, they're in these, either the land-based tanks or the floating dock rock rollers. So after they reach a size of like 10 to 15 millimeters, they go into bottom trays, like I was talking about, that little unit over there. So this is just our trays that are on the bottom at Little River. We have over 300 trays that um, constantly need gear maintenance. Um, so we need to make new ones. We need to make them to repair the holes in the, 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 the trays. Um, the, like you can see here, they're, they're they're the mesh that's inside of a larger mesh. So you have to prepare them every year and fix them every year. So that's what we're doing right now. We're ramping up for our next growing season and we're making more of these trays. We currently have 200 and we're looking to make 300. So we're gonna need the volunteers to come down and help with that as well. So their final stage when we go and plant them in the environment is under nets. Here's the team here, we're field planting the cohogs. Um, these little stakes in the background are where our nets are, so it's a blanket net. We put them at um, 100 to 150 per square meet, square foot. Um, they can only grow to about two inches at that density. They will then expel themselves, and then we'll have to move them to a new area. So that's going to be a large part of the volunteers.
So here's just a group of volunteers that are um, transplanting those quahogs into the new area. And that's just raking them out and moving them. The county, the Cooperative Extension, has just got a new um, hydraulic dredge that they're going to be using. So we'll have them come out and help us um, remove the quahogs and put them into new areas. So here's just a picture of the quahogs after they've grown to their size underneath the nets and then been moved. So once we harvest them, here's just our AmeriCorps planting the, um, the seed into our family areas. So like I said, we do need predator control in the area, so we do have crab traps. And here's just a picture of our crab trap that we've assembled by hand. We have 40 of them. We did have 80, but you know, the environment, you know, the water, the way waterways, um, we've lost quite a bit. Um, we've tried to recover some. Uh, they do get damaged by just boats, and even though we do properly uh, mark them, so we're constantly working on assembling them. And we do um, identify the invasive green crab. We have invasive green crabs here. The entire Cape does. They're um, from Europe, some are from Asia. There's two different species. And basically, the best way to eradicate them is to, to kill them. <laughs> so this is just our seeding efforts over the past few years. We really ramped up our production in 2014. Um, between 2014 and 2016, we put a total of 10 million coags into the environment. 2017 was our largest year, and we planted 8 million in that one year. So after all this planting, we need to monitor what they're actually doing to the water. Um, how, how well are they cleaning up? Um, so we do routine monitoring. So we have, the town has deployed up well, um, exo units. So that unit right here that I have displayed can measure dissolved oxygen chlorophyll, total suspended solids, turbidity of the water, all of parameters that um, can be affected by the co-op being in their environment. So we collect this data and it then goes to the School of Marine Science at UMass Dartmouth. Um, we had to take grab samples and they test for the total nitrogen. And in 2017, we were able to see positive results in Wukoi Bay, in Hamlin Pond and Little River. So our seeding efforts are really doing what they're supposed to be doing. This is just the data I just wanted to display. Um, this is going to work. So as you can see, the different years are outlined on the top, the different colors. So the long-term mean is basically without change. That's what's going to happen. Um, in 2010, they were pretty high. That's total nitrogen concentration. And then green, and the green is 2016, they came up a little bit more, even though our seeding efforts were there. Um, but in 2017, when we put in that 9 million cohogs, we did see a positive results from that. The total nitrogen concentration within the water did drop. Um, this is directly related to our propagation program and the commercial aquaculture licenses that are in the town. And this is just a blown up version. I also wanted to point out that in 2017, we had a record amount of faint rainfall. So this data even being a improvement is, is even more alarming because we were expected to see it go up with the rainfall. So with the cohogs, we even with the rain, we did see improvement. So it's, it's a good thing. Cohogs are doing their job. And this is just an image of all the rainfall that we had. So um, we had six inches in 2016, and in 2017, we had 14 inches within a time frame of a couple months. So with all of our efforts, we'd like to thank AmeriCorps Cape Cod. They're here today helping us out. Um, the Dennis Aquaculture Facility that gives us our seed every year. The Barnstable Cooperative Extension, and the Mashpee Wampanoag Tribe, um, UMass Dartmouth, Town of Mashpee, and the McCoy at Bay National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, I will be discussing two of our long-standing programs in, uh, that we've had, as Ashley had just described, so I'll make it fairly short and sweet. So this is just an addition, uh, so again, volunteer with Mashpee. We, we wanted to let everybody know that there's multiple opportunities in town and uh, more or less available year round. So you're more than welcome to do multiple programs. Um, you don't just have to stick to one, but it's of course up to you. So as I said, we have the two programs, the Mashpee Land Stewards and the Heron Count program. 
So the Mashpee Land Stewards, uh, the purpose of this program is to assess the current conditions of our lands and um, essentially to just let us know exactly what's going out on these parcels. We have very extensive conservation lands, about 2,200 acres and about 33 plus miles. Um, many of our uh, conservation areas are also located in the Mashpee National Wildlife Refuge, which is a kind of a little known secret in town we share with Falmouth, but um, we also have uh, additional lands outside of that. Um, so the opportunities within the land storage program were be to, again, walk, walk the parcels almost uh, as you probably were doing already and enjoying um, the, their beauty, but it's uh, just one step further to uh, inform us of, of anything that uh, is of concern, but of also of good, of good things as well, if things are clean and, you know, uh, there's some interesting wildlife observations, those are all, all very good information for us to have. Um, and we also have uh, pollinator gardens in town too that we also could use help with at, um, during certain parts of the year. So again, um, some of the issues that we just want to keep a hold of and again, having more people out on the parcels using them responsibly is a deterrence in and of itself of these bad activities, but illegal dumping, um, ATV usage, encroachment, um, as in people, uh, you know, clearing uh, parts of the conservation area for their own uses um, without sometimes thinking they just don't know any better, but <laughs> just to keep an eye on that as well, and uh, vandalism and erosion issues. And I will say that a lot of these issues have um, uh, really dwindled uh, due to the, the gates that we have put up and again, uh, more surveillance of these areas. So it's not, I don't want you to think that you're going out there to a big, a, a bunch of trouble. <laughs> it's really a lot, a lot of it's under control, but again, um, constant, you know, uh, help is always uh, desired for that, for the, for the uh, monitoring of these lands. Again, I, our department is about three people. <laughs> so uh, uh, fairly straightforward what you do for the land stewards program. And again, everything is online as far as signing up and um, these observation forms. And within these forms, uh, Four times a year is what we ask at least, to, is to note how the property is being used, any of those issues that I just mentioned, if you see, and, and also invasive plant species. Um, there's chances, of, there's some times where we can actually try to help manage those, even though sometimes it's more trouble than it's worth. <laughs> um, again, check for encroachment, pick up litter, um, you know, and just let us know of any improvements that could be, uh, could be made out there, better marking, um, more informational signage just about the different habitats and wildlife, which is something I've always been working on. And of course, with the uh, just taking the proper precautions, poison ivy ticks, I'm sure we're all unfortunately acutely aware of those issues. But again, part of the thing, a part of the work we do too is to keep the trails fairly open so it's less of an issue for people when they go out there and, and with, your, um, with your dogs, of course, too. And uh, the pollinator garden maintenance, we have four in town, Jehu Pond at the community garden site, Pickerel Cove, and also a newer one at Santuit Pond Preserve, which is a fairly new parking lot right off of 130 next to the Shell Station. Um, so again, uh, especially uh, coming in the early spring in the next month or two, we'll, we'll be starting to uh, do some work out there, and um, I would love to always looking to expand on these gardens, also at your own homes. I have a lot of information over at this table too. Um, so it's just something in general that we want to expand that wildlife habitat uh, throughout the town. Less green lawns and more diversity is what we're, we're going for. And these gardens can stand as a example as well of what to do at your own home. They're quite beautiful. I suggest going there spring, summer, and fall. I mean, you will see so many different species and if you really look closely, you'll see also a lot of different pollinator species. It's really quite exciting. So um, this is just a fun, a fun little slide of all the different animals capable of pollinating, some intentionally and some more or less a byproduct of, of their lifestyle. And these are just a few images of the pollinator gardens that we have, and uh, a lot of these are in their initial stages of growth. So the, uh, another program that I wanted to also talk about today is the Herring Count program, which is actually coming up in the next month. Um, we'll have a couple trainings in the month of March as well, including an event like today, but it'll be featuring this event, so I won't go into too much detail, but just generally uh, wanted to let you know that um, the program came about to, as a um, 
It came about in response to the uh, numbers of herring dropping substantially in the late 90s, early 2000s, and the Division of Marine Fisheries and Association Preserve Cape Cod uh, came up with this program to, to essentially prevent listing of them so they don't have to become, so they just would be afforded that much more protection, that much more limitations, but as of right now there's a moratorium on collecting them, even though they were once extremely abundant and used for, for bait by, uh, for multiple species, and not only that, but they're uh, the natural prey for a multitude of species as well. The ospreys actually time their migration up north with the herring migration. Um, so it's uh, also quite exciting to watch and to see. So um, this, again, why do we care about the herring? Um, just as I was saying, it's, a, it's what's considered a keystone species. Um, so a lot, again, a lot of uh, species uh, are dependent on them as prey items, including humans um, for bait, and also they're extremely important to the tribe. I believe the beginning of their new year also coincides with the, with the annual migration of the herring and uh, used to fertilize the Three Sisters Gardens as well as a food source. And um, they're anadromous, fancy word of saying they live in the salt water but spawn in fresh water, so hence they're migrating upstream during the spring uh, to, to spawn in the ponds. They also spawn in the rivers too. There's the two species blueback and alewives, they look extremely similar. I don't think, most people can't really tell the difference unless you're an expert, but for all intents and purposes, collectively they're called river herring and that's what this whole program is, is for. Um, so we have three active runs in town. A lot of towns only have one. <laughs> the three is, uh, can be very challenging, um, but uh, the first one I'll mention is the Mashby Fish Ladder, which is located right off of Route 130 near the town hall. Um, it's also uh, in the same uh, parking lot as the Mashpee Indian Tribal Museum. Um, so uh, it's the most popular place to count and one of the most prolific runs on the Cape as well. So last year, uh, you can't see the numbers here, but they were up, they were the highest count since the program has started. I believe it was around 350,000 was the estimate for the um, run size. So Again, the uh, purpose of people counting at these runs is to estimate these sizes and therefore, and go from there as far as any management changes that need to occur um, within the river itself or at, the act at these actual fish ladder structures. Um, so it's just like any other type of data collection, citizen science project, more data the better. Um, there may be zeros a lot of days. Um, unfortunately, a couple of these, the next two I'll mention, um, the fish ladders have some functionality problems that are being addressed right now at the uh, federal and state level and local level. So it can be a little frustrating to go down and, and ha see how they're having, a tr having trouble traversing these ladders. But again, all the data and observations are extremely important, even if it's not functioning at its highest level. With that said, the Mashpee fish ladder is one of the best examples, I'd say, of a very high functioning fish ladder. And it's extremely exciting to see because um, you're, you're kind of witnessing what was there traditionally, um, you know, these huge numbers uh, that, you're, that really the whole river should be essentially black with them. Um, so uh, you'll, you'll see that more often at the Mashpee Ladder. But there's the Quashant River Fish Ladder too, um, and that's at the interface of Johns Pond and the Quashant River. A little interesting about this particular ladder is that this was actually, oh, excuse me, was an actually uh, an artificial connection was dredged from Quashant River into Johns Pond. The original river outlet is the Child's River, which has since been dammed. Um, so in that in and of itself can create some issues in that it's not a 100% natural system that the fish are um, going into. But again, um, you know, they, it certainly still is an active run and the fish do, still do run here. And um, there's a lot of restoration efforts going within the river itself. Um, and there will also be an upper quashant river restoration in, on the horizon as well. And hopefully these efforts will also improve this, this area for um, herring populations. But again, you know, we need as many counts as possible out there all the time. And uh, any, the, I probably didn't mention this yet, but April and May are the two months in which we count. Beginning April 1st to about June 1st is the season. So it's a little cold out there. Uh, and again, you're, you're not, April 1st, you're not going to see, well, you may, but you're not going to probably see 100 fish, you know, you know shooting up that ladder. But, uh, but all the data is extremely important, and it does get utilized. Um, so uh, this particular uh, fish ladder is located um, just to the left of the town beach, the Johns Pond town beach that you all may be familiar with. So you just continue to walk off to the left, and then you will hit it. It's only about 500 feet. 
And the third fish ladder, and the furthest one as far as uh, the probably most difficult one to access, it takes about, it's about a mile walk round trip, but it's inside the Santua Pond Preserve. It's not a very long walk, but it's not some place that you can drive to as easily as the other two, just, just to give you a heads up on that. But this also is, um, it's, a, it's a brand new, well, it's a very new fish ladder. From, uh, it was built in 2013. Um, not to be negative off the bat, but it does have some functionality issues that again are being addressed and have been addressed since its uh, initiation back then. So there is actually quite a lot of fish that do run here. Usually it can be in the hundreds of thousands as well as of Mashpee, but um, again, uh, you know, it's difficult to, they do have some difficulty traversing the ladder, but again, it's, uh, it's just important to be down there and to witnessing what's actually happening. Um, you know, all, like I said, all the data is important, all of it. <laughs> yes, Jenny. So it, 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 I'm sure it's probably a, a host of issues, but yes, the functionality I'm sure is, is, is also um, is affecting the numbers. And the fact that the numbers are based on how many fish you're actually seeing cross, this, the, cross into the river, that's really what you're counting within 10 minute intervals. A lot of times you're actually not watching them do that. You'll see hundreds or thousands downstream at the lower pools, you know, waiting to go up. And, you know, there is some, there is rhyme or reason to it. I mean, it's a long journey up to just that point from the ocean that, you know, they do have to take breaks and, uh, and eventually, you know, they'll do that last spurt to just get right in, to get into the pond. But um, I think sometimes that the data gets skewed in that you're not actually, the numbers that they're basing the counts, uh, the estimation off of can be a lot of zeros in spite of the fact that there's a lot of fish there. So, you know, as I mentioned, they're, they're, and even hopefully within the next few months here, they'll do some changes within the structure itself to make it more passable. But it's still pretty, it's still exciting to see though, you know, you see the, all the um, predators, a lot of avian predators, cormorants, ospreys, um, and we're seeing a lot more bald eagles too on the Cape in general. I'm hearing more about that every day. So, you know, it's also a chance to see one of those. And once you see it next to an osprey, you'll realize, wow, that's a, Really big bird. <laughs> you, know, you think ospreys are big. Mm -mm. So, you know, again, uh, it, it's just, it's really important to also to have almost this kind of before and after data when they do fix these ladders up again um, to hopefully, that to a, so they'll be in a better state and, uh, and these herring counts can, um, can really take off and, and, and really be functioning more as they were intended to. So um, just, just quickly on how to conduct the counts, we have kits at each site. It, you get a little clicker if there happens to be so many fish, you know that you, it does help you keep count. Um, but you do, it, you do count in 10 minute intervals, you stand right at the interface where the fish are traversing into the pond or swimming upstream into the pond. And I have all of that um, very uh, highly detailed on our website. I didn't have that necessarily here for today, but I will also in March. Um, but a very specific place where you stand, and then for the 10 minutes you count them, as many as, as there are that's, um, that pass into the pond, and you take the air temperature, the water temperature, there's a weather condition a key that you go from, but if it's cloudy, rainy, et cetera, windy, and also the comment section, which I think sometimes really functions, is extremely important with the fact that these ladders aren't, uh, don't function as well as they should in that you can at least mention that there are quite a few fish on the, on the bottom, you know, lower pool. It's not that there's nothing here, you know, because a zero can kind of seem like that, but, but the comments can clarify that, oh no, there are definitely fish here. It's just I didn't happen to witness them, you know, running upstream. And um, that's all I have for you today. Uh, Thank you very much. And um, we do have, as you can see, uh, some more information available here on, the press, on these tables. Um, and also I have some sign-up information if you're interested in these two programs as well, just on the table over there. Um, any questions? Yes, Dave. Uh, um, you know, I don't know if they did do any of that. I do believe that there, these were all, um, these are all traditional populations. Uh, I, I believe they're all natural populations of, of river herring. It's just that um, Child's River used to be the, I believe, the run for John's Pond, but it's both the Aquasha and the Child's River have been heavily 
impacted by um, by milling, damming, and uh, cranberry bog operations. So it's kind of hard to determine exactly what you know where these natural populations started to suffer the most and, and where they are now. And it's it's kind of hard to make that distinction. But there wasn't. I don't believe there was any artificial um, stocking to to prepare for this. They they, they are. It's extremely ingrained in them instinctually to, to follow flow and temperature changes to start running upstream. Um, you know, it, it really is just within their genetics to, to do so. But if there isn't anywhere for them to go, you know, or if there's blockages or other issues, that, you know, that's really what this program is also helping to, to address. Any, anyone else? All right, thank you very much.